Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have a great show for you tonight. Next to me is the illustrious Casper Leach. Hey, Mr. Bling Man, you get your bling. I do. Happy Friday. And the bow tie of the day. Oh my gosh, yes. And, and honor of uh, rep- uh, Representative um, Blumenauer. Blumenauer. And over in the wings is Mr. John Cornette. How have you been doing the past oh, week, really John? Oh, really good. Uh, Casper told me to quote him. <laughs> okay. That's a good quote. Uh, we have some hip news for you. We'll be taking your phone calls here after the news, so stay tuned. A couple of uh, fun videos, and uh, we'll bring on first our dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. First couple of stories tonight are from the from here in Oregon, the Oregon Senate Bill 460 to allow the limited sale of recreational marijuana at licensed medical marijuana dispensaries beginning October 1st, passed the Oregon Legislature with a vote in the House. The measure, which had already cleared the Senate, passed the House on a 40 to 18 vote. Uh, adult social marijuana sales would otherwise have had to wait until the Oregon Liquor Control Commission got the rules in place sometime late next year, leaving customers to buy it through the black market. Noting that cannabis sales won't be taxed until January, Democratic Representative Andy Olson said it will take time to get a tax structure in place. The tax holiday will help encourage consumers to get their marijuana from a licensed dispensary, where it will be tested and, uh, rather than on the black market. Also here in Oregon, last week, Democratic Governor Kate Brown has signed legislation, Senate Bill 364, allowing for expungement of some past marijuana convictions. The measure states that, quote, when a person convicted of a marijuana offense based on conduct occurring before July 1, 2013, files a motion for a court order setting aside the conviction pursuant to ORS 137.225, the court shall consider the offense to be classified as under current law when determining if the person is eligible for the order, end quote. This bill took effect immediately upon signing. So if you have a conviction for marijuana in the state of Oregon, you can now apply to have that expunged or downgraded. That includes you, doesn't it? It does. I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, an old uh, 1986 uh, marijuana manufacturing charge could be Uh, at least downgraded, if not expunged. We'll see. Okay, across the river in Washington, a bill simplifying the tax scheme for marijuana was signed into law by Washington Governor Jay Inslee last week. HB 2136, which the legislature approved, also significantly loosens the rules on buffer zones that have kept recreational I-502 marijuana shops away from many dense commercial areas. As originally approved by voters, Initiative 502 taxed adult social cannabis at three tiers, producers or growers, processors, and retail. Under the new scheme, the three-level tax system has been collapsed into one 37% point of sales tax. According to Ian Eisenberg, proprietor of Capitol Hill Recreational Marijuana Shop, Uncle Ike's, his customers won't see much of a change in pricing due at 37%. I-502 originally stated recreational marijuana stores can't be located within a thousand feet of parks, schools, and other public places. Localities could soon have the power to bring that buffer down to 100 feet under Washington's House Bill 2136. Down south, Democratic uh, Governor Jerry Brown of California signed legislation 
Assembly Bill 258 to allow medical marijuana patients to be considered to receive organ transplants. I personally have known over 100 people who have died because they used medical marijuana and were not allowed to have uh, be on the transplant list. Hospitals in California and elsewhere have denied patients from receiving organ transplants solely based on their status as medicinal marijuana consumers. Assembly Bill 258 reads, quote, a hospital, physician, and surgeon, procurement organization, or other person shall not determine the ultimate recipient of an anatomical gift based solely upon a potential recipient status as a qualified patient as defined in Section 711362.7, are based solely upon a positive test for the use of medical marijuana by a potential recipient who is a qualified patient, end quote. This new law takes effect on January 1, 2016. In a prepared statement, the bill's sponsor, Assemblyman Mark Levine, said that the new law will save lives by ensuring medical cannabis patients are not discriminated against in the organ transplant process. According to a study published in the American Journal of Transplantation, marijuana use by patients undergoing transplants does not adversely impact survival rates. Across the country in Washington, D.C., members of the United States Senate have introduced Senate Bill 1726, the Marijuana Business Access to Banking Act of 2015, to permit financial institutions to engage in business relationships with the marijuana industry. The measure is a companion legislation to a House version of the bill, H.R. 2076. The Marijuana Business Access to Banking Act of 2015 provides, quote, a safe harbor for depository institutions providing financial services to a marijuana-related legitimate business, end quote, and provides legal protections to both financial institutions and their employees. The Senate version of the bill has six co-sponsors, while the House bill has 26 co-sponsors, including uh, Oregon Senator Ron Wyden and Jeff Merkley and House uh, Representative Earl Blumenauer. Um, no industry can operate safely, transparently, or effectively without access to banks or other financial institutions, and members of Congress should move forward with this legislation so that this growing number of state-compliant businesses and their consumers may operate in a manner that is similar to other legal commercial entities. In another story, Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts wants to clear the roadblocks out of the way so that government paid researchers can study marijuana and not just the negative side effects. Warren is leading a group of eight Democratic senators who are urging federal officials to correct the data shortfall on potential health benefits of medicinal cannabis by making it easier to study the herb. She, Warren said, quote, it's important that we make a concerted effort to understand how this drug works and how it can best serve patients through appropriate methods of use and doses like any other prescribed medicine. The senator wrote in a letter to government officials. The letter was sent to the heads of the Department of Human Services, or HHS, the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA, and the Office of National Drug Control Policy, all of which have some control over cannabis-related rules. Since marijuana is still inexplicably classified as a Schedule I substance under federal law, meaning it supposedly has no medicinal value and a high potential for abuse, it remains difficult to study. Researchers are forced to go through multiple layers of approval to even test the stuff, and under current rules, it can only be grown at the University of Mississippi in Oxford, Mississippi, by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, or NIDA. Ironically, the uh, HHS, Department of Human Services, also has a patent on marijuana for its use as pain control and in cancer uh, control. So on one hand, the federal government says it has no medicinal benefit. On the other hand, the federal government has patented it because of its medicinal benefit. Go figure. Out in the middle of the Pacific, Hawaii Governor David Inge on Wednesday signed House Bill 321, legalizing and establishing a system of medical marijuana dispensaries in the state of Hawaii. Medical marijuana has been legal in Hawaii for 15 years, but patients haven't had an official place to buy their medicine. Instead, they had to grow their own cannabis or had a caretaker do it for them. The bill will also stop counties from enacting zoning regulations that discriminate against licensed dispensaries and marijuana production centers. Uh, the governor said, quote, 
I support the establishment of dispensaries to ensure that qualified patients can legally and safely access medical marijuana. We know that our challenge going forward will be to adopt rules that are fair, cost effective, and easy to monitor. The bill sets a timeline, Governor Inge said. They'll make a good faith effort to create a fair process that will help the people most in need, end quote. Hawaii's HB 321, now Act 241, creates the framework for a dispensary system that would allow up to 16 dispensaries statewide by July 15, 2016. Down in Santa Monica, California, states that permit qualified patients to access medical marijuana via dispensaries possess lower rates of opioid addiction and overdose deaths, according to a study published by the National Bureau of Economic Research, a nonpartisan think tank. Researchers from the RAND Corporation and the University of California, Irvine, assess the impact of medical marijuana laws on problematic opioid use as measured by treatment admissions for opioid pain reliever addiction and by state level opioid overdose deaths. The uh, study said, quote, states permitting medical marijuana dispensaries experience a relative decrease in both opioid addiction and opioid overdose deaths compared to states that do not, end quote. They found that women over the age of 40 showed the most significant decrease in problematic opioid use. The data published in 2014 in the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA, Internal Medicine reported that the enactment of statewide medicinal marijuana laws is associated with significantly lower state-level opioid overdose mortality rates. The authors of the study said, quote, states with medical cannabis laws had a 24.8% lower mean annual opioid overdose mortality rate compared with states without medical cannabis laws, end quote, the investigators reported. Overdose deaths involving opioid analgesics have increased dramatically over the past decade, while fewer than 4,100 opioid-induced fatalities were reported for the year 1999. By 2010, the figure rose to over 16,600, or an increase of over 400 percent, according to an analysis by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. The full text of this study do medical marijuana laws reduce addiction and deaths related to painkillers is available online at uh, www.nber.org. That's nber.org. Our last story tonight is from South America. Uruguay has stood up to the United Nations on the issue of marijuana legalization, refusing to back down after several meetings with officials from the international body. Juan Rubalo, uh, president of the Uruguay's National Drug Board, or JND, announced on Thursday that he will present a report before the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights defending the country's legalization and regulation of the cannabis market. Rubalo said he would urge the UN to discuss legalization without taboos. He said, quote, Uruguay has embarked on a different path. Not only have we made proposals, we have also taken effective concrete measures in a different sense, end quote. Robolo added that the whole world is watching Uruguay and emphasized the special commitment the country has to run a successful legalization process. The UN, meanwhile, claims the legalization law approved by Uruguay, quote, is incompatible with what is stipulated in the 1961 convention, end quote, referencing the single convention treaty on narcotic drugs and international treaty restricting the production, manufacture, export, import, and distribution of various drugs. Uruguay's decision to legalize cannabis has kicked the hornet's nest, according to JND Secretary Milton Romani. The country will not pull back, according to Romani, who said the repressive anti-marijuana policies in effect prior to legalization are more dangerous than the drug itself. He explained that they are not talking about revising the conventions, but rather about upholding the ultimate goal of these treaties, which explicitly say they seek to improve humankind's health and well-being. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime criticized Uruguay in 2014, suggesting their marijuana policy would not only affect drug control in Uruguay, but also negatively impact the fight against drugs in other countries. Neighbors are not especially the control of cannabis. Both the Uruguayan government takes the position that marijuana use is a public health issue that has been wrongly criminalized in the past. 
The administration of President Tabar Vasquez on Thursday released a statement arguing that the criminalization of the use and possession of drugs infringes upon the right of freedom and autonomy. End quote. Thank you, Uruguay. Okay, that's the end of our hip news segment. We're going to jump over to Mr. John Coronet. How are you, John? Oh, great, brother. That is such good news. And, you know, I can testify to the uh, uh, pain uh, uh, mitigation. I mean, it's helped it, you it, get it, off it, a lot of opioids. I remember lot, when I first brother. met you. Uh, yeah, I was on, when I, before I met, just before I met you, I was, I was on 720 milligrams a day of OxyContin, 240 milligrams every eight hours. That would kill I a was, lot of people. I was almost dead. I was in a hospital bed. Uh -huh. Cannabis saved my life. I'm not kidding. Look, I got this song here that a fellow, a, a friend of mine uh, named Charlie Lessman uh, recorded. He wrote it and recorded, and I just love the song, and I'm going to play it for you right now. Did you know the sun will shine one day And everything on earth will melt away All the oceans rise above the land Drowning every woman, every man. Oh, let's make the best of it now. We'll be just another asteroid floating through the mind of Sigmund Freud. So many years we've been upon this place. Can you believe the future that we face? Your time will pass. You've got to do just what you want to do. And if somebody tries to ruin your day, walk away. Did you notice that the world's so strange? Because her atmosphere's about to change. So many reasons why we killed the trees. Life is passing with a subtle breeze. Oh, let's make the best of it now. Another chapter as we turn the page. As we exist within a nuclear age. I know that freedom's heard around the globe. Just where our future lies, well, nobody knows it. Oh, let's make the best of it now. Never know when the sky will fall. Maybe the moon will reach the earth one day. We're not the same race that we used to be. Can't you see? Now the next time that you fall in love, just appreciate the sun above Cause the sun is shining on and on So open up your eyes before it's gone Whoa, let's make the best of it now Whoa, let's make the best of it now Thank you, thank you. And you sure did. That was fantastic. I think that's your thank best you. yet. Oh, thank you. Thank Absolutely. It's a good song. It's a good Absolutely. song. Very inspirational. It's Mr. John Cornett. We'll have him back at the end of the show. Uh, welcome. Hey, Casper. How are you, man? Very good. How's your week been, Paul? It's been busy, busy, busy. Just seems to get busier, but that's a good thing, so I'm not complaining. Uh, if you are out there and you have a question for us tonight, you can call that number that just popped up on your screen. It's 503 288 4442. That's 503 288 4442. We have a couple of calls already standing by. So uh, let's jump right into it and take a phone call. Welcome to the show, caller. Hi, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? Hey, uh, I'm just, I just have a question about industrial hemp and, okay. and what's happening with that. Here's some industrial uh, hemp hemp yeah. twine, hemp oil, flame, hemp flame of freedom. But those are all products that are manufactured and then brought into the state. What is anybody right. growing hemp in the state? 
this oil is Canadian oil. This twine is Chinese hemp twine. Yeah, we, we don't have any manufacturing in the United States yet. But we're hoping yeah. that a few farmers in Oregon will lead the way this year. There have been some small yeah. harvests the past couple of years in Colorado and Kentucky, but there are going to be some commercial-scale farms this year in Oregon, or they already are planted and growing right now. Okay. So then, as I understand the law, those people have a license, right? We do. Yes, that's exactly right. And there's a limited amount of those licenses? You know, uh, no, there is not a limited amount, but there is a minimum amount that they have to cultivate. I think they have to cultivate at least 20 acres. Don't quote me oh. on that number. I'm going to have to look that up. Oh. But there oh, is no, a no, minimum amount. They the can't grow things it. smaller than 20 acres, and they have to grow low THC hemp that's less than three-tenths of 1% THC. Yeah, yeah, and I'm only interested in the fibers part of it like that. I don't um, really care about any other part of it. Well, you know, I, I think the fiber is great. In fact, I sold hemp paper, and uh, if you go to the great book of hemp out there by Rowan Robinson that was published in 1995, it will tell you that my companies here in Portland, Tree Free Eco Paper and Rope Walk Paper and Fiber, were the first hemp companies in several generations. So I sold hemp paper primarily as a business from 1990 through 1997. But uh, so I'm, I'm very interested in hemp fiber. I'm hoping to get back into the hemp paper business. But I think hemp fuel is the real future. Hemp seed oil is the main reason marijuana was prohibited. And so what we will see ultimately, I believe, when it comes to industrial hemp is that we won't be growing those low THC varieties because they only produce about half as much fiber and 1 20th as much seed oil and protein. So what we'll see is high THC cannabis grown that uh, we harvest the seeds from. It's seeded. We take the residual cannabinoids for uh, medicine and adult social use, and then the residual protein will be food, and the residual fiber will be used for paper, building materials, canvas, rope, lace, and linen. Well, yeah, that would be fantastic. But as of right now, and what's happening right now, where, as I understood the law, is that if you, manuf if you grew up here, you had to manufacture it to the finished product within the state of Oregon because you couldn't export it or anything like that. Yeah, I'm not where sure. Would I, where would I go find, I guess, more information about this? Because, like, some of the things that I have heard and I have understand and there's, I've read. There's several like, attorneys that are working on this. I would direct you to uh, a several-time guest on this show, Courtney Moran. Uh, an attorney who's been working on industrial hemp. She helped organize an event we went to back during Hemp Education Week in uh, uh, early June, about a month, uh, five weeks ago. And so, uh, uh, in the National Hemp Industry Association. Okay. And uh, Julie, what was her last name again? Courtney is her first name, last name Moran, M-O-R-A-N. Thank you very much. I appreciate your guys' time tonight. There You're are a handful of companies around America that are using hemp uh, base as their as their products. Like Squeaky makes the uh, stain, the hemp stain that's uh, becoming very prominent in many of the uh, uh, places that you go and shop for. I can't say any of the the online names, yeah, but I like know. Lumber and uh, One Lumber or oh, those I know what you mean. Yeah, those Dave Sieber. Right, Dave Sieber so makes Hemp this, Shield, right, not which is to used for. Well, we can say Dave Sieber and we can say Hemp Shield. We can't okay. promote commercial products, right. no, but no, he no, makes no, a that. stain that right. uh, that can be used uh, on wood to preserve wood. And it's amazing. It's proven itself to be better than uh, what else is on the market these days. Lasts longer and uh, easier to work with. So uh, that's the other thing I like about hemp products is that they have proven to be not only beneficial for the earth, but they're also better than anything that's competing with them. Yeah. Do you know so, any more of these conferences that are coming up at all? Say that again? Do you know of any more of these hemp conferences that are going to come up? Hemp conferences. Not right off the top of my head right now. I can't tell you one. Sorry. Oh, okay. Stay tuned. We'll, we'll talk about them in the future, though. Okay. Thank you very much. And, uh, um, is, is any of uh, these references on your website at all, by chance? Yeah, yeah. If you go to our, our website... Uh, well, there's a lot of information on there, hemp.org slash news. 
and then search for their uh, hemp stories. You can find a lot of the uh, latest news on that. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate your help. You're welcome. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Again, if you have a question for us tonight, you can call us at 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442. We have another caller standing by. Welcome to the show, caller. Yes. Hello. Hello. How are you? Uh, well, I am sick with multiple sclerosis, and oh. I'm curious if MS would be uh, relieved uh, through the smoking of... Yes. Uh, yes, it is. In fact, both smoking and the use of it edibly actually is shown to slow the progression of multiple sclerosis significantly. So oh, if you wow. have multiple sclerosis, you should be using cannabis. You don't even have to get the high associated with cannabis uh, to... Uh, receive the medicinal benefits and the uh, uh, control of muscle spasms, pain, and slowing the actual progress of the disease itself. Amazing, amazing. There's been a handful of studies here recently that have concurred yeah. with that as well. Yeah. How can I go about acquiring this product? Uh, you know, it, what, do you live in Oregon? I live in Portland. Okay. Just give us a call at 503-281-5100. That's 503-281-5100, a number which will pop on your screen in just a moment. And that, there's the toll-free number. Uh, and you can, and, and there's the local number. And uh, we have doctors standing by that will help you get a permit. Uh, but right now you can grow your own, which takes a while. But once you have this permit, you'll be able to visit the dispensaries and buy untaxed cannabis. Oh, well, um, it sounds really wonderful. I'm looking forward to having some relief from this. Uh, again, I'm a patient with the Veterans Hospital, and they will not have anything to do with this at all. Sure. You know, a federal law was passed that says they can't discriminate against you if you have a permit to use medical marijuana. So as soon as you have that permit, you're protected from any kinds of sanctions by the VA. Both Casper and I are, are United States Army veterans, and uh, I'm a disabled veteran as well. So uh, uh, I understand uh, uh, the process there. Okay. So, again, I'm looking to procure uh, this uh, medical marijuana. I still don't know how to do that. Like I said, you can give us a call at that okay. number. I can't, re what you've got to do first is get a permit to legally possess, use, and grow medical marijuana. And then you can go to any one of several hundred, almost 300 stores here in the state of Oregon and buy it. Uh, they're okay. all over Portland now. And uh, uh, in fact, if anyone with any of these conditions right here on your screen uh, qualifies for medical marijuana, but MS and other neurodegenerative diseases like MS uh, have been shown to slow or halt the progression of the disease. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't turn back the clock. So the sooner you start using medical cannabis, the better off you'll be but it will stop or slow the progression of the disease and relieve the symptoms. So I need to find a outlet somewhere in the city of Portland and, and get the yeah, information if you call, from them? Yeah, if you call, that's the toll-free number, and this is the Portland number right here. Call that number. At this time, you're going to have to leave a message, but somebody will call you back tomorrow and be able to help you. I should do thank you for your help, sir. You're welcome. Just write down that number, 503-281-5100. We have compassionate, caring doctors that will help you get that permit, and then you can go visit these uh, uh, stores. Uh, right now, though, it's legal for you to possess up to an ounce of marijuana, but call that number, and we will be happy to help you. Wow, that's really terrific. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good luck. It's really a blessing to be able to help people. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to uh, uh, do this and to be able to help people. Uh, that are, are sick and dying. So I'm, I'm honored to uh, help someone in that condition, sir. Uh, we'll be taking your calls again in just a moment, but we have a little video that Al Jazeera put together, the okay. Arab 
uh, Qatar-based uh, uh, news channel has their English language broadcasts, and they've been sending us some videos uh, anytime they'd make one on cannabis. So here is their video about how high is too high. How high is too high? If you can't find your keys, you're probably bordering on that. I can't find my keys when I'm not high. I'm here in beautiful Portland, Oregon, where the prayers of pot smokers statewide have been answered. Legal weed. Last November, Oregonians voted to join three other states in legalizing recreational marijuana. Anyone here over 21 can carry up to one ounce in public, have eight ounces of weed in their home, and grow up to four plants. But just because you can smoke legally doesn't mean it's always fun, safe, or classy. I want to know, how high is too high? That's why I'm at Weed the People, a celebratory event focused on responsible consumption. How high is too high? Smoking too much will merely put you to sleep. A fit of giggling for like 40 minutes or something, that's too high. How high are you sure on a scale of like cotton mouth to fingers are cool? Fingers aren't cool. Are you high right now, Erin? Not much. Oh, we just like had a little toodly do. Nothing much. Nothing to write home about. Dude. Yeah. A toodly do. I yeah. love it. The day-long weed extravaganza was put on by a local marijuana columnist and pot connoisseur, Joshua Taylor. Are you always high? I consume a regular basis when I'm awake, but I would not say to a point where I'm impaired. How are your eyes so white then? Years of practice. Thanks to legalization, the state estimates it will rake in $40 million a year from pot smokers new and old. So what should consumers know about the marijuana they're about to smoke before they do so? I think they should know the manner in which it was grown. I think that if at all possible, you should always have your products tested for pesticides and molds. Now you have more terminology, products, and equipment than most people can keep track of. This right here is sort of a breakdown of your cannabinoid profiles. When you use organic, you tend to get better flavors, better aromas. I'm smelling a nutty, oaky, no, that's wine, I'm sorry, uh, like hint of hazelnut. So how can people go about testing their limits? I think you should always test in private to begin with. It's good to have a friend with you, to not have any plans to drive, uh, operate power tools, and to go slow. Can I can I do like a little reflex test? Do you know what one of these is? Uh, one of the little hacky sack balls, uh -huh. Okay, ready? No, 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 no. This is a hacky sack. You know if you fail. This is just a failure for all people who smoke weed. It's just like, no pressure. Too high, you're too high, man. Let's do this. Nice. Oh my god. Oh, I'm the one who can't. Nice, you got <laughs> You almost killed a hippie. But not everyone is convinced that responsible weed is all fun and games. I talked to Tom Parker, who works for an organization that helps teens deal with substance abuse. I think it's gonna be easier for younger folks to get their hands on it because if it's if it's legal, the supply increases and access increases. For me, smoking weed was the best thing in my teenage years. Being a teenager sucks. It does. I think people tell you that teen years are the best years of your life. It's a bunch of hooey. It's the worst years of your life. You're not a little kid and you're not an adult either. Enter marijuana. Enter marijuana. Many studies have shown quite clearly that it really affects all the things that you need and your brain is developing. As a teenager, it's negative for that brain in development. I haven't read the studies. So are all stoners underachievers, or do some actually play in cover bands? Willie Nelson, Steve Jobs, Carl Sagan, all daily hardcore stoners, and they've all done quite well for themselves. Do you sit around and eat no, powdered no, donuts no, all day? No, I don't do that. No, I'm too busy gardening. I'm well educated. I have a college degree. I have five college degrees. I'm a computer programmer. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. I mean, in a lot of ways, weed has helped me uh, do that because, you know, when I hit a problem I don't understand, um, you know, I can, I can smoke and at times see things from a different way. So how are you going to prevent people from smoking weed? I mean, do you, do you scare them? Do you just show like a burnout with Cheetos, you know, just dripping down from their mouths and like all the resumes they never sent in front of them? I think it's important that you realize that with marijuana, there's good and bad, I suppose, in everything, and you have to figure out what that means to you. Are you ready to take the risk of the unknowns? So there you have it. The rules of weed are kind of like the rules of life. Educate yourself, and don't be an a-hole.
Okay, well, we can thank Al Jazeera's English Language Service for that nifty little video. Thanks for sending it to us. So are you ready to take the, the risk? I are am, you ready to I've weighed the options. see if your, your no, brain I, is... Some of it, this? though, is because my peers you know, encourage me, and they're always, like, pushing it in front of me and telling me that I'm not cool if I don't smoke it, you know, so that's part of it, too. But, yeah, I'll take the risk. I'll take the risk. Okay. I'll try it. We have a couple callers standing by. Let's go ahead and take one of those phone calls. Welcome to the show, caller. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I have a question. Um, I've had a couple. Hi, I'm waving back, honey. <laughs> hey. I have had a couple of bags of leaf, or it, and it's kind of all. Anyway, it's something I could use to try to cook with or something. But yeah. is it any good anymore? That's my question. How old is it? How old is it? Um, a couple of years. Yeah, you probably can cook with it. It, it loses about 10% of its potency a year. So uh, if it's a couple of years old, uh, it's about 80% right now. Uh, I heard somewhere on the uh, grapevine <laughs> or marijuana vine uh, that... Uh, the older it got, the better it got, like wine, and I didn't quite. No, that's it. not true. <laughs> no, it's the the fresher it is, the better it is when it comes to cannabis. Okay, and one more question: They're not going to mess with my medical marijuana, are they? No, they are not. We're just going to keep expanding it and try to make it cheap and plentiful. Thank you. They've messed with it across the river in Washington State, but in Oregon, it's it's we're we're not going to. Uh, curtail the medical marijuana program. Great, because I have a grower. That's really the only way I can afford to smoke it. I figured out with my license cost and the uh, grower's cost, it costs me two dollars and fifty cents a week to smoke all year. <laughs> I see. Well, that's not too bad. It's less than a not pack of all. cigarettes, right? Well, thank you so much, and you have well. a nice show. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for calling in. If you have a question for us tonight, you can give us a call at 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442. Um, let we have another caller. Welcome to the show, caller. Oh, not that one. Marijuana helped me with my emotional whiplash yesterday. Okay, what does that mean? And that means I woke up yesterday morning and I heard that Obama was in prison. And I just danced and I got high and it was like music and happy. And then I hear it was like a tour, like when you go on holiday with the kids. It was a, so it was like, well, then the I had to first, get happy again. So the I first president to go into a federal prison. So well, that we, yeah, that, voluntarily. Yeah, no, there <laughs> haven't been any that were put in involuntarily. Ford pardoned Nixon. So, uh, so what was Michelle's husband doing in there anyway? I heard he made some good quotes. And he's he was saying that we've got to reform the criminal justice system, and I certainly yeah. agree with that. Uh, we'll see if he can uh, have any progress here in the last year and a half of his uh, uh, administration. But uh, uh, there seems to be bipartisan support for this, so hopefully that's the case. Okay. Well, like I said, it was an emotional whiplash. It was happy and then sad, and I had to get all. So thank you for the good marijuana that I, I get. It helped me get through that, that rough day yesterday. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, I went out and visited our garden yesterday, and already the plants are about 11, 12 feet tall. Now, are you talking so about your garden or your 40 acres of my, my farming? Name. My garden here in Portland. Oh, okay. I'm exactly. I know sometimes you'll call your 40 acre your garden. Just yeah, well, that's a farm. Yeah, okay. That's a farm. But, uh, again, if you have any questions for us, you can call us at 503-288-4442. Are you getting photos of your, of your garden? Yeah, yeah, there'll be, there'll be some out there. Uh, when all things in good time, Padawan. Sounds like our governor's pretty groovy. It is. You know, I worked for Kate Brown during her first legislative session. I... Uh, uh, was an intern in her office in fighting the recriminalization of marijuana back in uh, the first half of 1997. So if she let me work in her office, she's got to be pretty cool in my book. And I th is, it, is it true that the former governor's wife's going to have a marijuana growing TV show? <laughs> no. Oh. No. I like that. 
I like that I joke. Just curious. Just, yeah. No, yeah. no. I don't know what's going to happen with Mr. Kitsop. She's probably pretty much of an expert, what I hear. Um, no, I don't think she ever got off the ground, is what oh. I understood. But uh, well, most good growers she say had plans that, right? that, that made the media somehow. Oh, okay. I mean, I really don't know. But uh, that's the way that cookie crumbles, <laughs> you know. So how are things going out in the land of time for hemp? Hey, Rock, we're having a new artist come on and, and bring new shows. We like that. We got Gatewood's Legacy joining us in a couple of weeks. And we got uh, Paula Willett yes. in Kentucky. And we got right. Cannabis Labs that's kicking off their second show next week. We appreciate that. We got a couple of new sponsors that have been coming on board. We are grateful for that. And our audience is growing with new apps that people can use to download into their smart devices to share us with your friends. And, and so we're pretty stoked about being the only all cannabis, all the time broadcasting network on iHeartRadio. And thank you, Paul, for the shameless plug about how wonderful timeforhemp.com is and how you can share us with your friends. Okay. You're just like, like, just throw the switch. And I appreciate it. There goes that 30 second uh, there you go. Uh, relation. Well, I'm pretty excited about the expunging criminal records. Uh, uh, it, they say that if what you were doing is legal today, then uh, you can have your record downgraded. And I think I had been convicted back in 1986 uh, for growing or manufacturing uh, marijuana. I think now that becomes a class A misdemeanor. Yeah, you were so, one of those radical people back then with all those hippies. I guess so. Yeah. I guess so. I'm still a pretty radical person, mm. but uh, <laughs> that's another story. Well, again, if you have any questions or comments for us tonight, you can give us a call at 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442. Forty-four, forty-two. I have a question, Paul. Why is it that we have all these great, wonderful headlines pertaining to the advancement of the uh, end of prohibition, and still we have the members of the DEA doing these raids and kicking in doors and killing dogs? And is that like a hobby that they can't give up? Are they addicted to that, or what? They uh, are paid. Yeah. And so they're. Uh, there are some of them that are true believers. Most of them are corrupt, and they're just trying to line their pockets with black market money. But uh, uh, it's uh, something, hopefully, that's changing. For instance, the federal government said that Native American nations could grow cannabis, but a couple of weeks ago, right, a uh, uh, Native American reservation right at the corner of California between Idaho and, I mean, excuse me, between Oregon and Nevada uh, was raided. And they, mm -hmm. they took the th thousands of plants and mm -hmm. over 100 pounds of processed marijuana. So uh, I don't know the story behind any of that, but it seems to counter the declaration that the federal government had made just a exactly. few months before that saying that uh, these folks could grow marijuana. Again, that emotional whiplash that I was talking about earlier in the show. Get all happy and then surprise, right? But it, it sounds like we're going to be able to quit hiding our money underneath the carpets for all these dispensaries. It's still going to take a while. The bills are just introduced. They haven't passed uh, uh, through the, the Congress yet, and there is some opposition. So those bills have been introduced numerous times. But uh, eventually, one of these days, uh, the common sense will open. There are some banks now that will comply with the uh, onerous regulations imposed by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the federal banking authorities and the Drug Enforcement Administration and the DEA. Uh, unfortunately, just uh, uh, this past uh, few weeks, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that uh, Marijuana businesses could not take standard business deductions, that they had to pay uh, taxes on all of their income, and that they could deduct regular business expenses that all other businesses are able to deduct. That doesn't make sense. They say you as a business cannot take these business deductions. Right, and I, and I can't believe the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, 
ruled in favor of that, but that's what they did. That's and like so. what you said earlier at the top of the show, whereas there's no medical benefit, but oh by golly, we've got a patent. Yeah, yeah, the federal government has a patent on cannabis as a pain uh, for pain relief and as uh, an anti-tumoral, anti-cancer agent. So on one hand, the federal government has this patent for uh, cannabis's medicinal value, and on the other hand, they say it's a schedule run drug and it can't be uh, used for any medical purpose. And so because of its schedule one status, there's no research allowed on women of childbearing age, for instance. So all of that research has to take place out of the United States, but it's just another way that certain elements and political conservatives have been able to turn back the clock and uh, uh, try to, uh, they buy into the lies that are sold to them by the uh, uber wealthy, the the one percent, as they well. I know I've said it before, called. and I'll say it again. I think those members of Congress who are against any type of ending the prohibition and can't believe that there is medical benefit to marijuana should engage in taking a medical marijuana suppository. That will certainly clear your minds. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but you agree? Every member of Congress who's against that should be sent a suppository. This really might make you see better. I <laughs> don't know. No, no. I don't think we should force them to do that. Okay. Uh, we should just set term limits and vote them out of there. Oh, that's good, too. That would be the good thing. That's good, too. That's true. Some of those congressmen, if you send them a suppository, they might not stop. They're so I don't full know. Of it, right? They are pretty full of it. <laughs> pack it in there. Anyway, um, so if you have a question or comment for us tonight, you can call us at 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442. I have a question, Paul. <laughs> okay. I know I have been lucky enough to be asked to be a guest speaker at the Seattle Hemp Fest and as you as well. And I know that you're also planning another remarkable Hemp Fest here in Oregon. How is that going? You know, we are continuing our fight. A judge actually ruled against us just in the past uh, week. And so we're going before the city council and we're appealing that judge's ruling. Uh, I don't see how they can do that, given that at the Portland Blues Festival, they allowed marijuana smoking, and the police said they weren't going to intervene and didn't have any problems with it. But at our event, they said we allowed marijuana smoking. Well, in fact, we did not allow marijuana smoking. We followed all of their instructions to violate the rights of our festival attendees. And uh, so we had the police saying we weren't complying. We had the attendees saying you're cracking down on us. We were left in an untenable position. And so the police basically are lying. But that's what a lot of police do is they lie. No. And so uh, they're lying and saying that we allowed cannabis openly and blatantly and encouraged its use when that was definitely not true. Uh, so it's... You uh, think it might have been the same police officers that said that, that were the same police officers that while you were paying them at the order of the city to stand guard over the last event or so, they were instead watching some kind of wrestling event and hanging out. And that was one thing. Another thing is they had us hire an organizer. We had to pay this one guy $12,000 to basically do nothing. Wow. And we had to pay another $50,000 in security costs. So overall, uh, you know, they're, they're lying, and they're trying to discredit us, and uh, we will continue the fight. For that much money, you could almost buy a politician. There you have it. We have someone here in the studio. Let's let that uh, studio microphone go. Go right ahead, Judy. Continuing on that subject, and I wondered when you go before um, um, the Portland Board, will that be a public hearing? The Portland City Council, Portland yes, City it will Council, be. Rather, Portland City Council, will it, that, will that be a public hearing? Yes, and, and people, anyone there will be allowed to talk for three minutes. That was my next question. Yes. So we can all show up in force. Will you let us know? Yes, I certainly Thank will. Thank you so much. I certainly will. Even if we get 1,000 people to show up? 
I think they'll have some timeline that after a certain time you sign up and whoever signs up first gets to talk first. And uh, that's how it works in the uh, city okay. council. We have a phone call standing by. Welcome to the show, caller. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in uh, the sale of marijuana and when it will go to public auction, like uh, like uh, tobacco is. So there will be a public auction between uh, sellers and buyers and who will be able to be a broker for marijuana for like uh, to distribute it? Thank well, you. you know, there was a public auction that one grower did up in Washington last year, uh, but so far uh, that hasn't been determined here in the state of Oregon. So far, uh, it's been growers going individually to the dispensaries, and if they have a legal license and are able to grow it. They have to fill out a That's form. The they have to have the patient's signature, permission That's to point. sell it, and uh, then they're able to sell it individually to the dispensaries. But uh, in terms of a public auction, I know one happened up in Washington. I haven't heard about any plans for any in Oregon yet. I'm, my question is, is there a possibility for an auction where uh, growers come and they auction off their products, and buyers, individuals, can say, I'll, yes, I will spend that much for that eight ounces of it so I can keep it for myself at my home. When is that going to be happening? Well, I mean, like, it, it won't well, be, be to be individuals. Uh, the, the auction up in Washington were by licensed growers and processors to licensed retailers. And so if there is a public auction, that it won't be to, to individual consumers, but rather to processors and uh, retailers. And there are a lot of processors out there, all these different uh, uh, companies making extracts that are looking for product to make into extract right now. And so uh, I can't say exactly when those auctions might happen, though. As an individual, I'm asking, is it, uh, are we looking at uh, uh, being able to go to the auction house and say, uh, if you, or, or can I have, can I have a, a farmer grow my, my portion of weed for me as a, as a recreational user? You can grow four, right now the law is in transition. So what we can do here in the state of Oregon is we can grow four plants in our household and have eight ounces of flowers, some food and some extracts. But outside of your home, you can only carry one ounce. And so you can't, uh, individual consumers are not allowed to buy more than one ounce at a time. And if you have a I, medical card, that's a lot different, right? Yeah, if you have a medical card, you can buy up to a pound and a half. And I, have I, more I, don't, I don't have a medical card. But I understand. is it possible that I can have like a, a CSA or whatever, a farmer cooperative? Yeah, that's possible. What do we have to look at in the law? To, to you have to go, uh, you know, those licenses aren't going to be issued for some time. Right now, the only licenses are medical, and the Oregon Liquor okay. Control Commission will be issuing licenses, uh, but not until probably this time next year they'll start uh, uh, figuring out how to do that. So we're still a little ways away from that. Thanks a lot. Okay. Have a good night. Thanks for your questions. Okay, well, uh, we are counting down. We've got just about four minutes to go. Uh, you want to plug your websites one more time, Casper? I would encourage people to go to timeforhemp.com and check out all of our team players. We've got about 17 different hosts that are dedicated to ending prohibition and are raising the voice of the marijuana movement. We are the only all-the-time all cannabis broadcasting network on iHeartRadio. You can get a Google uh, app to enjoy on your Android phones at the Google Plus store and of course we've got all kinds of other great apps all of our mp3s are available and free to download and we have free cartoons that you can also enjoy and share with your friends we at time for hemp also encourage the spaying and neutering of all politicians keep that in mind and share us with your friends all right and I have uh, a plug for our THCF medical clinics. We have doctors who can help patients from sea to si shining sea, uh, from Hawaii to the east coast of the United States. So if you're 
Looking for a doctor who can help you or a loved one get a medical marijuana permit to legally possess, use, and grow marijuana, just give us a call. Outside of Portland, call us at that toll-free number, 1-800-723-0188. That's 1-800-723-0188. If you're here in the Portland area, you can call us at 503-281-5100. That's 503-281-5100. We also are continuing our work in favor of uh, the further liberalization of marijuana laws. If you want to get involved in the movement to end adult marijuana prohibition and restore industrial hemp, you can call us at 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. Or go to our web portal out there at hemp.org, H-E-M-P dot O-R-G. Mr. John Cornett is standing by, ready to play another song at the end of our show. So without further ado, I want to thank Casper for coming on. Thank you for watching. Thank our studio audience. Next week, we will have a tape show. I have a couple business meetings I have to go to, uh, and so I won't be here in Portland. But we will be on with a pre-recorded show next week on the 24th, and we'll be back the following week on the last day of July and with a live show here at this time. So stay tuned and remember to help us help you restore hemp. <gasps> Thank you.